Welcome to Archaeoed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americans. You know, the ones that American history books never talk about. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all over the planet for over 30 years now. In this podcast, I'll share what I've learned. Sometimes it'll be stories of my adventures. Other times, it'll be things I've learned along the way. It'll be whatever I feel like talking about because this is my podcast, Beholden to No One. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. It's Christmas break of 1996, at midnight, and my phone rings. It's Linda Sheely. Getting right to the point, as she always did, she said, Ed, do you want to dig at Copan? Shocked, but playing it cool, I simply said, yes. Then she said, can you go next month? It's a four-month project. Again, I said, yes. She said, great. I'll call you after the New Year's, and hung up. And that began my field season at Copan. Little did I know then, we would end up finding the tomb of Copan's lineage founder, Yash Kuk Mo. So as you can hear, I've decided not to do a lecture-style episode this month. Instead, it's story time. From January to May of 1997, I was part of an excavation crew that made arguably the most important discoveries of Copan's over 100-year excavation history. Before I go any further, let me set this story in time and space for those unfamiliar with Copan. Copan is a classic period Maya city in modern-day Honduras, close to the border of Guatemala. It's one of the most beautiful of all ancient Maya cities. Bill Fash once said, If Tikal was the New York City of the Maya world, Copan was its Paris. It's centered in a lush green valley, ideal farmland. Rather than having temples spread out across the landscape, Copan has a single huge acropolis that grew larger and larger over the centuries. That Acropolis is like a huge Russian doll with all the earlier versions nested inside. Due to a thick brown clay used in all the construction phases, archaeologists have been able to tunnel into it. In fact, there are over five kilometers of excavation tunnels inside that Acropolis. Our 1997 project was in the lowest levels of the tunnels, corresponding to around the early 400 CE. That was the time of Copan's lineage founder, Yash Kuk Mo, and finding his tomb was our unstated goal. I say unstated because it's not cool to go tomb hunting anymore. Instead, ours was a project focused on understanding the architecture of Copan's earliest Acropolis. If we found tombs in the process, which was almost inevitable, so be it. So how did I get there? It was good luck and good friends. The project was led by the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Bob Scher was in charge. He was finding some hieroglyphic texts and wanted Sheely to be the project epigrapher. She agreed with one caveat that they had to take some of her students on the excavation crew. Christopher Powell was a no-brainer. He had lots of contract archaeology experience and had dug over 100 burials in Arizona. He went down the year before and was a huge help. Most of the UPenn grad students had no previous excavation experience. When it came to choosing a second Sheely student, Chris recommended me. Most of Sheely's students were art historians, but I, like Chris, had years of contract archaeology experience. So the job came to me. That part was luck. But stepping through the door, that was all me. Anyhow, in January of 1997, I flew down to Merida, Mexico to meet Christopher. He was working for a foundation in Yucatan and had already driven his truck that far. 
Over about a week, he and I drove the rest of the way to Copan, Honduras. We visited tons of ruins along the way. Kalakmul, the Chenes region, Zunan Tunich, Tikal, Washaktun, and finally Kirigua before we crossed the border into Honduras. That last 18 kilometers were hairy. It was all dirt roads through a winding mountain pass. Our back wheel briefly came off the road in a fishtail, but we made it there in one piece. Our lodging at Copan was in the house of David Sadat, Bob Sher's second in command and our direct boss. He and his house manager, Julia, welcomed us warmly and took good care of us. Julia cooked our meals and did our laundry for the four months of our stay. Chris got a separate little house in the front yard, and I got a room attached to the side of the main house. Bob Sher had his own house next door. There were lots of other graduate students living in town, too. Harvard and an Australian university had projects running as well as ours. Some of those students went on to become important professors. Marcelo Canuto is now the director of MARI at Tulane University. Charles Golden is a professor at Brandeis University and currently excavates at Sox Sea in Chiapas. Bill Saturno works at Boston University and directed the excavations at the amazing pre-classic ruins of San Bartolo in Guatemala. And those are just a few. It was a heavy-hitting crew. We all met most nights at the Tunkul Bar. I thought I'd have to tone it down and be more professional, but it turned out the Ivy League students were crazy partiers. I could barely keep up. One thing that they all made very clear early is that Chris and I were considered the hired guns from Texas. Together, we had more excavation experience than the rest of the students combined. Truth is, I kind of liked that. Texas hired guns? Well, hold my beer, Ivy League. On my first day of the job, David Sadat led me into the tunnels. Ours were so deep that we entered at the river cut, 15 meters underneath the Acropolis's surface. I followed him to the building named Margarita, where the 1996 season had ended. On its front face was an amazing, full-color stucco panel. Those brown clays had preserved it perfectly. The image was two giant birds with their necks entwined, one a quetzal, the other a macaw. Floating above them were hieroglyphic symbols that said yash, meaning first or green. Quetzal in Maya is kuk. Macaw is mo. Altogether, they spelled yash kuk mo, the name of Copan's founder. It was an actual X marks the spot for his tomb. And indeed, buried inside the building was a tomb. The individual inside had 33,000 pieces of jade on their body. Looked like a king to us. My job would not be there at first, but rather excavations in the tunnels at that same level. I was to find and map out the buildings contemporary to Margarita. The tunnels were many, and getting lost in the labyrinth was easy. So Sadat tested me. He brought me quickly around, lefts and rights, ramps and ladders, all the walls looking very much the same. Then he'd stop and ask me where we were. He'd say, point to Margarita. And I always knew. Funny enough, I can thank video games for passing Sadat's tests. Back then, I was playing a game called Doom. It, too, was a labyrinth with identical walls. You had to count your lefts and rights to know where you were. As it turned out, video gaming was a life skill. My time in those tunnels was crazy. Sadat gave me six different excavations to oversee all at once. All day long, I ran from one to the next, quickly taking notes and giving directions in my broken Spanish. Thank goodness for the competency of my Honduran crews. Some of them were second or even third generation archaeologists. They knew what they were doing, even when I didn't. They would hit a wall or a floor and just stop. 
Then they would wait patiently for me and explain what it was. My notes were full of the smart things that those guys told me. Slowly, we put together a map of the buildings of Copan's first Acropolis. To my surprise, many of those early buildings were made of packed earth, not stone. They were hard to find. Sometimes it was just a thin layer of exterior stucco that separated them from the brown clay fill in between the phases. Working in the tunnels was backbreaking and dangerous. The tunnel walls were just clay. We didn't shore them up at all. As long as they were humid, they were stable, and luckily Honduras was constantly humid. Nevertheless, collapses happened. One day while walking through the tunnels, we heard a big thump behind us. When we turned, we saw a big section of tunnel roof had fallen out. Laid perfectly on top of it was a skeleton. A burial had just fallen out of the roof and tried to kill us. We named that guy Phil. My father is an environmental engineer. When he came and visited, he called the tunnel wall soils a term I had not heard. Exeotropic. He explained that during an earthquake, exeotropic soils flow like water. So if an earthquake happened, we'd all be buried in an instant. The valley had an earthquake roughly every 20 years on average. It had been 18 years since the last one. Not really a comforting thought. There were also funny moments. One early morning in the tunnels, I yawned big and a bat flew straight into my mouth. It took a moment to spit it out, and then I went running for water to wash my mouth out. When I returned, the Maya workers were still laughing so hard that there were tears in their eyes. That night in town, on my way to the Tunkul bar, random strangers pointed, laughed, and yelled, Murcialago! That's bat in Spanish. Word gets around fast in a little town, I guess. One of my favorite tunnel memories is break time. I'd go outside for a snack and some fresh air. Not once, but three times, the ruins mascot, a spider monkey named Poncho, would join me. I think he thought he was a human. He would sit on the log next to me and hold out his hand palm up. I would give him a cracker, and he would eat it slowly, bite by bite, just like me. What a surreal thing it was, eating crackers with a gentleman monkey under the shadow of Maya pyramids. Well, I'll take my first break here, and when I return, we'll talk about my life in Copan. In my capacity as the director of Maya Exploration Center, I'll be leading four tours this year. My Olmec tour filled up instantly, and my Oaxaca tour is two away from full. But my Machu Picchu tour in September still has places. We'll start and end in Lima, visiting museums and a pyramid still standing in the middle of the city. Then we'll fly up to Cusco, the capital of the ancient Inca Empire. After a few days there, we'll head by train to Machu Picchu. Most people take the train out, see it real quick, and head back to Cusco that evening. But I think that's crazy. On my trip, we stay for two whole days, fully exploring the ruins, climbing the mountain behind them, and enjoying a fun little tourist town in the valley below. Then after that, we'll make our way back to Cusco through the Sacred Valley, exploring more ruins, eating lunch along the Urubamba, and visiting a little llama farm. I lead different kinds of trips, and they're always fun. If you'd like to come with me to Machu Picchu this September, shoot me an email, and we'll talk about it. Life at David Sadat's house was challenging. David is an excellent archaeologist. He's also an eccentric lunatic. I'm not scared to say that publicly, because if David heard it, and he might, he'd just laugh and agree. He had a little group of tropical birds living at his house, all of them rescues. Two of them could talk, 
a fact that I immediately regretted. He had a big macaw he called Yash Paco. Apparently, he was a rescue from a troubled family farm. He could make cow and pig noises, which were fun. Also, rooster calls, which he made all night. My windowsill was his favorite perch. He'd sit there and yell into my room. His favorite phrase was, Tu abuela! He'd repeat it over and over. Tu abuela! Tu abuela! Tu abuela! That means your grandmother in Spanish. If I yelled at him to stop, he'd switch gears and cry, No, papa, no, no, papa, no! I mean, Jesus, what had that bird seen? I forget the name of the other talking bird, but she was a green parrot. She was originally a gift to the president of Honduras, and she was taught to sing the Honduran national anthem. The president, unfortunately, hated it, and somehow she ended up with Sadat. Every morning at dawn, she would break into the anthem. It started, Tu Bandera, Tu Bandera. It was horrible. I'm glad that I've forgotten the rest of how it went. Julia cooked dinner every night. Chris and I, David, Julia, her kids, and the birds were always all at the table. I hated spaghetti night because it was Yash Paco's favorite. He would stomp around the table trying to eat off everyone's plates. David would distract me on purpose. When I'd look back and see a fistful of spaghetti in Yash Paco's talons, David would just laugh and howl. Oh, Yash Paco wins again. <laughs> then he bought ducks. Bob Cher objected, saying they were nasty birds. David just kept replying, I've got two words for you, Bob. Orange duck. The door to my room didn't close right. Even a slight breeze could blow it open. One night I came back from Tunkul late and my door was open. The room was full of ducks. I shooed them all out, took my clothes off, and flopped into my bed. That's when I realized the ducks had crapped all over it. It was cold that night, and my mandatory cold shower did not help. Neither did the fact that I had no blanket anymore. Luckily, my seething anger kept me warm. I told Sadat in the morning, but again, he just laughed at me. Julia did our laundry, but it never all came back, especially socks and underwear. I'd ask her about it, but she'd just pretend that she didn't know what I was saying. One day I was following David through the tunnels, and I could see my EB initials on the underwear sticking out of his pants. I said, David, you're wearing my underwear. And he replied, I am? Gross. And just kept walking. But the weirdest thing was yet to come. David was always looking for a way to make an extra buck. He decided that he could lure old folks away from retirement homes in the U.S. to do it way cheaper in Honduras. He got exactly one taker, a gigantic Eastern European man who was suffering from dementia. Unbelievably, this man turned out to be a former and very famous wrestler named the Masked Marauder. There were many masked marauders after him, and even a Marvel Comics villain of the same name, but this guy was the OG. He was very demented, but luckily very happy too. His former retirement home wouldn't let him smoke, but David let him have all the cigars he wanted. I tried to talk to him, but it was like he was speaking in tongues. Part English, part Spanish, and then Eastern European languages I couldn't understand. And then he'd just break into laughter and couldn't stop. Honestly, I was a little scared of him. One morning I woke up late to Yash Paco's grandmother insults and heard David saying, Get to the truck now or walk to the ruins. I knew he meant it. I grabbed my boots and ran out to the front yard, where the masked marauder was standing like a tree in his tidy-whitey underwear, 
smoking a cigar and singing the national anthem with the bird. I dodged him and ran down the dirt road, throwing myself into the back of David's moving Suzuki. Looking back on it, it was kind of fun. And I was digging at Copan. I would have suffered more for the same opportunity. And it wasn't all suffering. There were some fun things as well. Our almost nightly excursions to the Tunkul Bar were a blast. I got to know the other students very well, and I still keep up with many of them. As we became friends, we took weekend trips together. Sometimes it was just to the local hot springs, but other times farther out. Lago Yehoa in the middle of Honduras was a favorite. We'd also go to a beach town called Tela. One long weekend, we even went to Antigua, Guatemala. We also had house parties. The other projects had big field houses and great backyards. There was a lot of drinks and a lot of hookups. I know at least two marriages that started at those parties. Two local guides were also part of our crew, Dennis and Julio. They were nuts. Their boss would sometimes leave them in charge of a closed hotel called La Madrugada. Whenever he did, they'd invite us all to go skinny dipping in the pool. Really, life was good. But during Semana Santa that year, I got dengue. The rest of the students went to Antigua again, but I just had to lay in bed. They call it break bone fever down there, and yes, it hurt like hell. But the truth was that Sadat was working me so hard that lying in bed and reading books for a week, even in pain, was a welcome rest. When the students came back and the project started again, Sadat put me in the tombs helping Christopher. I'll take my final commercial break here, and when I return, I'll tell you about that part of the adventure. This commercial is not for me. It's about an organization named MOM. MOM stands for Maya for Ancient Mayan, or in Spanish, Maya Antiguo para los Mayas. By the way, they didn't pay me to make this commercial, or for that matter, even ask me to. I'm doing it because I support and admire them. MOM is the evolution of a program Linda Sheely started 37 years ago. She went down to the Maya world every summer to teach Maya people how to read and write in the hieroglyphic script of their ancestors. Some of them got really good at it and started teaching others in their communities. Flash forward to today, and there are hundreds of Maya who can read and write in hieroglyphs. There are over a dozen modern stela that have been erected in their communities, and more are being created every year. This is a first in world history. When has a culture been divided from their writing system only to regain it 500 years later? MOM is an organization dedicated to keeping that going. They fund and teach classes in Maya communities throughout the year. In addition, they hold an annual conference where teachers and students all from all around the Maya world get together and share their progress. The funds to run and attend these programs are modest, but they're still out of the reach for many of the communities they most benefit. And that's where we come in. Small donations from individuals are what make their wheel turn. Just a few bucks and you can be part of this moment in history. I give every year. Would you consider doing the same? Their website is www.discovermom.org. And I'll put that in my show notes. Mom.org was actually already taken by the Milwaukee Art Museum. Go figure. Anyhow, please take a look at the great things they're doing and support them if you can. Thanks. I have returned. I'm sure those commercials were very compelling. So, okay, after Semana Santa, which is Easter Holy Week, Cher and Sadat moved me into the Margarita tomb. They had plans to present it at a conference that summer and needed the excavations completed. Chris was doing all the excavations, 
but he needed someone to collect, bag, and catalog everything that came out. Let me briefly set the scene. The margarita structure was 25 meters under the top of Temple 16, directly underneath. Temple 16 is on the surface, with hieroglyphs on its superstructure calling it the Lineage Founder's House. In front of Temple 16 stands Altar Q, which displays 16 kings of Copan, with the founder Yashkuk Mo handing a baton of authority to the king who commissioned it, the 16th king named Yash Pasa. Ricardo Garcia had been digging into Temple 16 for years, going deeper and deeper, phase after phase of building sequences that got older and older. Copan's magnificent Rosalila structure was an early phase of Temple 16. Crafty David Sadat did the math and figured out that he could bore in from the river cut and make it directly to the very first phase of Temple 16. That's where we were, or so we thought. Every sign said that we were. Heck, Yash Kukmo's name was on the front of a building with the richest tomb ever found in Copan. Images of Yash Kukmo found decades before made it clear that he was connected to the authority of Teotihuacan, likely through Tikal. He's always depicted with Tlaloc the rain god's goggle eyes. Those mark him as a Venus Tlaloc warrior, again, straight out of Teotihuacan, which, by the way, is 1,600 kilometers away from Copan. A thing that I saw that season that I've never seen published was two burials just next to Margarita's staircase, just outside the building. Both were male, stretched out with shell-made goggle eyes on their skulls, and atlatl pieces in their hands. Just as telling, or perhaps more, both men were about 5 foot 10 inches tall. A tall Maya is 5'5". Five five. Those two guys weren't Maya. They were probably from Teotihuacan. Where are those bodies now? I don't know. Someone should find them. Silver alert. Anyhow, for about a month, Chris and I worked alone in the tomb. I know that sounds cool, but even after just an hour in a tiny dirt box 75 feet under a crumbling pyramid, the excitement turned into a gut check. So let me describe the tomb. It's a little hard to visualize. In typical Maya fashion, the superstructure or temple top of Margarita was destroyed when the next phase was built on top of it. They left the basal platform and dug the tomb into it before burying the whole thing. It was a temple in life, but then retrofitted into a tomb in death. The Maya brought their temples to life and then gave them a death by destroying them in a process we call termination ritual. In the case of Margarita's tomb, they had built a staircase down into the tomb. Above the stairs was an incredible offering in a purpose-made niche. That was our first task, to dig and disassemble that offering. It was complicated, because it was layers of mostly organic matter. On the top were a bunch of bowls with foodstuffs like shrimp and fruits. Only stains remained, but you could see the impressions. By the way, the nearest source of shrimp was 80 kilometers away. In the center top was an amazing pot that Sadat named the Dazzler. It was a Teotihuacan tripod vessel. Most of its paint had fallen off, but you could see a temple with goggle eyes of Tlaloc peering out of it. More Yashkuk Mo sign, in our opinion. Chris and I carefully collected all the fallen paint chips and the amazing restoration team in the lab put it all back on the pot. I couldn't believe it. So beautiful. I'll put a photo of the restored Dazzler in my show notes for you to see. Underneath the pots got more complex. It was layers of organic matter, 
which Chris took apart carefully, one layer at a time. Color changes helped us see the divisions. We had a grid over the offering, which was about three by two feet in size. Each grid block was about three inches. We pulled the layers off in three inch blocks, labeling them and putting them in bags with their coordinates. The tag would say something like, block 3E, layer four. The layers were amazing. One was a weaved mat for sure. Another was clearly flowers. On the bottom, it was a jaguar pelt. There were also a few gray-colored layers that we had no idea what they were. And I never heard from the lab on those. I don't know what they are to this day. Anyhow, after the offering, it was time to work on the tomb itself. The chamber was just big enough for the raised slab that the body was laid out on. We entered from one end with the body's feet closest to us. We built a small scaffolding around it with boards to crawl on above the body. Poor Chris had to lay down on top of them all day. I got to sit comfortably on the stairs just outside the tomb. Again, he slowly dug into the first stucco that had fallen from the ceiling, and then a mass of jade beads covering the body. The final count of jade beads was 33,000 beads. I bagged it up three inch blocks at a time. Chris had made a fantastic drawing of the whole thing, which made my job even easier. I was basically his secretary. The body was covered in red cinnabar. The skull was also red, but sparkly. Months later in the lab, we learned that just the skull had been removed and repainted multiple times, and that's why it was sparkly and the rest wasn't. We also noted that there was cinnabar on the walls, not painted, but deposited probably by water. There was a definite water line and cinnabar going back into the cracks of the wall. It was not from rainwater that had seeped in over the centuries. It was the Maya purposely flooding the tomb. We found drains leading in and out of that tomb, so we're pretty sure about that. I had found similar drains in my excavations of the surrounding buildings, so we even had a correlation of where these pipes might have come in and out of. Maybe it was sending this individual to the watery underworld, but practically speaking, it would have also helped get the flesh off the skeleton. I know that's gross, but the bones were all painted. That didn't happen while there was still skin on them. Chris and I concluded that they soaked it until the flesh came off, and only then did they paint the bones and add the jewelry. Yuck. I hate tombs. Give me a walk in the jungle looking for buildings any day. But if I never go inside another tomb for the rest of my life, it'll be too soon. We got the tomb all cleaned up in time for a very important visit from the renowned physical anthropologist Dr. Jane Bykstra. She was there to perform the magic trick that she had recently pioneered. It's called strontium studies. By chemically analyzing tooth enamel, she can tell where a person grew up. Spoiler alert, Yashkuk Mo spent his younger years eating corn around Tikal not Copan. We led Jane down into the tomb. She peered in as Chris, David, Bob, and I sat behind her on the steps like excited school children. She looked in for just a second, and then she turned around to us and said, Well, boys, it looks like your king gave birth to at least one child. We were floored. What? The body in the tomb is female? Yes, it was. Jane could see it in the pelvis from four feet away. After a moment of silence, David said, This calls for an architectural probe. And yes, this is my David Sadat imitation. Have any of you heard him speak? How am I doing? If he heard this, he'd probably say, That imitation is a waste of saliva. He actually said that to me in the tunnels once. I was trying to explain what I had found, and he stopped me by saying, 
This conversation is a waste of saliva. As I say, he's a lunatic, but one hell of an archaeologist. So we do David's architectural probe. We knew there was one more building underneath Margarita. David had named it Hunal, meaning first place in Maya. So we dug under the Margarita tomb to expose the top of Hunal's platform. If there was another tomb, it would be inside there. We had to open up a space big enough to dig into, so we excavated the fill between Margarita and Hunal. In the matrix, there were stone blocks from the superstructure of Hunal, pieces of its destroyed temple top. Now, this is something you won't find in a book, or at least as far as I'm aware. If you do, please tell me. I wish I had pictures. As we opened up this new tunnel, we found four blocks with stucco painted on one side. They were white background with little human figures drawn on them. The figures were visiting temples, interacting with each other, and walking from place to place. Two blocks had a series of black painted footprints leading from one place to another. That same footprint iconography appears in Mishtek and Aztec codices when they tell about pilgrimages or long journeys. I immediately said to David, Holy crap! These are pieces of a mural inside Yashkuk Mo's first temple. They're telling us the story about how he got here. I begged him to let us dig for more, but he said we didn't have time, and more compellingly, if we dug the tunnel any wider, it would collapse on us. So I let it go. But not really. I'm still upset about it. Anyhow, when the tunnel was wide enough, David popped out a central block of the floor, and sure enough, we were looking into another tomb. This one really was Yashkukmo. David joked, I've personally found Yashkukmo three times and I am looking forward to my fourth. But this was really him. Once we knew where the tomb was, we were able to dig down, around, and enter from its side. Like Margarita's tomb, he was on a raised slab with lots of ceramics underneath. One was another Teotihuacan tripod vessel. David immediately cried, We'll call this one the Astounder. But Bob, in his quiet, gentle way, just said, That's enough, David. The body was covered in jade and other jewelry. Not as much as Margarita, but still pretty nice. He had a big jade pectoral a rectangular bar, and a very bad break on his right arm. It had never really healed properly. You could see it right there in the tomb. And of course, he also had goggle eye pieces made of shells. I'm proud to say that I was the first to notice the similarities to his image on top in Altar Q. On that altar, each of the 16 kings is dressed differently, and each has a different pectoral piece. The Yashkukmo figure has a plain rectangular bar, just like the jade one we found in his grave. But much more telling, he had a little square shield strapped to his forearm. The shield is right where we found the nasty break on the skeleton's arm. Alter Q was commissioned 400 years after Yashkukmo's death. It feels hard to believe that they would remember details like a broken arm, but I don't have a better explanation for that little shield. I think they did remember exactly what he looked like. So anyhow, it was a huge discovery. Between the Margarita tomb, now believed to be Yashkukmo's local wife, and his tomb, it was really the single most important field season since Copan's initial discovery in the mid-1800s. National Geographic came in and documented the whole thing. I didn't make any of the photos, but Chris did. The issue is the 1997 December issue. So if you want to look that up, go ahead. I'll swipe some of the photos from the internet and put them in my show notes if I can. The final two weeks were spent report writing. My part was all the work in the tunnels figuring out the first levels of the city 
which by then we were calling the UNE platform. I'm not sure if those reports were ever even published, and if they were, they probably didn't have my name on them. They had Sadat and Cher's names on them. We submitted them to the Honduran government, and that's the last I ever saw of them. In May, Chris and I drove away in his truck. He kindly agreed to drop me off in Belize, where I spent another three months mapping the city I had found the year before, Mashna. My wife asks me all the time if I missed the field, and the honest answer is no. I'm glad I did it, and it makes for great stories now. But at the time, it was mostly a daily beating, and I am honestly not sure if today, as a 55-year-old guy, I would sign up for that beating again. Until next month, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, recorded, and voiced by me, Ed Barnhart. If you like what you heard, please like, share, comment, and do all that other stuff I'm supposed to ask you to do. And if you really liked it, consider supporting Archeo Ed through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Archeo Ed. I'm in there somewhere. I make these podcasts for free, but I'm not opposed to making money. In fact, if you folks could free me from my day job, well, I'd be much obliged. Archeoed is my intellectual property. All rights reserved. Copyright 2024.